Good morning. My name is Kat Kinzer, and uh, as Britt mentioned, I uh, work with the American Red Cross. And I am uh, here today delivering this presentation on behalf of my colleague, Dan Joseph, who some of you may know given his many years of engagement with the OSM community. Uh, Dan did plan to be here today. Uh, I had planned for Dan to be here today. Uh, <laughs> uh, however, uh, he is currently deployed and supporting our response operations in Europe. So we will wish him well in that endeavor, and I will do my best to represent on his behalf. Uh, but I will also flag if there are any questions that are beyond the scope of my pinch hitting, I will make a note of them uh, for future follow-up. There we go. So I want to start with some brief context uh, for those who may not be as familiar with the Red Cross movement. Uh, the American Red Cross is a part of the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies. This is a global network that is present in almost 200 countries. Uh, I intentionally added our friends from St. Lucia onto this slide given the presentation yesterday uh, and their work in the mapping space. Um, each national society uh, does things a little differently uh, and might have their own focus and context. Uh, we are all independent organizations within our countries. Uh, however, we are bound quite tightly together uh, by a humanitarian mandate to prevent and alleviate human suffering uh, without discrimination and to protect human dignity. Uh, we are guided by seven fundamental principles, which you see there up on the screen. Uh, they are humanity, impartiality, neutrality, independence, voluntary service, unity, and universality. I could do an entire session, or two, or seven, on the seven principles, uh, but uh, to keep this conversation going, um, the main takeaway here really is around humanity and impartiality. So humanity is very much the ethical stand that motivates our work as humanitarians and really sets the goal for to, pretend, to prevent and alleviate human suffering wherever it is found. And impartiality means, among a lot of other things, that we endeavor to relieve the suffering of individuals being guided solely by their needs. So these are important distinctions to keep in mind as we go through our engagement in this space. So to meet the needs of those that we support uh, as a movement, we work across many sectors. Uh, put another way, we are much more than just blood drives, although I would be remiss if I didn't take the opportunity in the, uh, to the group to flag uh, we are currently in a blood shortage. Uh, and so if you have the availability and the willingness, I encourage you to make an appointment uh, to donate blood. Um, but as super important as blood drives are, uh, we, are uh, we do much more than just that. Um, we also support people during times of crisis, and that's everything from house fires to disastrous hurricanes. Um, our humanitarian mandate means that we and our national uh, societies, our partner national societies, are active throughout all phases of the disaster management cycle, which you see up there on the screen. The phases include preparedness, response, and recovery. Another way to think of that, about that is before, during, and after. So we are all working um, during what we refer to as blue skies and gray uh, throughout the process in order to better prepare, uh, respond, and recover to, to crisis. So when a large disaster hits, our team works to support uh, the national societies that may activate to respond. And specifically, we support the four R's. And I've been laughing for days because the R's are not actually on that slide. But that just means it'll stand out to you and you will remember them. Not least because I will mention them repeatedly during the course of my, my talk. Um, so specifically, what we mean by the four R's we try to get the right information in the right format to the right person at the right time. Um, this is critically important. Um, so we will continue to refer back to this. Um, if you just think about geospatial information, you can imagine the very urgent need during a disaster uh, in order to respond effectively to have actionable, accurate, and accessible uh, data. So uh, getting the right info in the right format to the right person at the right time. Um, an example of that, just keeping it super simple, you know, somebody tells me wind speeds in an area reached 100 knots. Um, okay, sounds bad, but it doesn't really tell me anything. And it certainly doesn't inform how I might respond or work with our teams to respond um, versus someone saying, hey, you know what, those winds reached 100 knots. Um, they, it occurred in a predominantly residential area, and they were strong enough to damage, heavily damage, well-built homes um, and uproot trees. 
this is much more useful for us to think through, okay, how do we respond? How do we position? What sorts of issues are we really looking at um, and need to think through? So as humanitarians, engaging with data, um, you know, how do we get from, hey, it might rain, to letting someone know, hey, you are going to need an umbrella. Um, and of course, in our space, it's usually a very big umbrella that is needed. So maps and other geospatial products play a really important role um, across that framework of getting the right info in the right format to the right person at the right time. We're all gonna be chanting that by the end of this conversation. Um, everything happens somewhere, um, and, and it's super important for us to know not just the where, but the what and the how. So OSM has actually been a key component of our humanitarian work since at least 2013. Um, for a while, I'm given to understand that uh, the first onboarding task of any team member in the GIS unit was to set up an OSM account and make an edit to the map. Um, specifically, we love OSM as, as a global source of open geographic data um, and appreciate from a community engagement and accountability perspective that it can be updated by people with whatever features and details that are most important and most relevant to them and to their situation. Um, I reflect back to two of the, at least two of the sessions yesterday, the map Malawi and uh, the land rights case studies um, as really clear and powerful examples of, of the, the need for local ownership and engagement with OSM data collection. So, you know, understanding the where um, is not just about, hey, how do I get from point A to point B, but it's also from a humanitarian perspective, understanding the needs, you know, tracking the impact before something happens and after it happens, um, identifying gaps and, and a multitude of, of other concerns. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So for us, uh, OpenStreetMap provides an opportunity to engage both digital volunteers to, um, as well as local communities to improve the availability, the detail, and the accuracy of geospatial data. Uh, so let's take a swing, a quick swing, through some of the things that we've done, some of the things we've learned along the way, some of the things we're still learning, um, and also what we're currently working with and, and through, and some of the questions that we might be asking some of you may have answers for, and we would love to talk to you um, about what you uh, think about some of this stuff. So, start with missing maps. Uh, we helped, found, American Red Cross helped found missing maps in 2014, along with a consortium of organizations that included the British Red Cross, uh, our friends here present this weekend uh, with the Humanitarian Open Street Map team, um, as well as Médecins Sans Frontières, Doctors Without Borders. And it was with a goal of getting people excited and engaged uh, with mapping areas that were at risk of disaster before a disaster would actually hit. Uh, for those not as familiar, very briefly, kind of the three steps of the missing maps process, remote volunteers would trace satellite imagery into the map, uh, community volunteers on the ground would then go and add local details such as street names or neighborhoods or evacuation centers um, with an ultimate goal of humanitarian organizations being able to use that mapped information to plan risk reduction and disaster response activities um, that ultimately help save more lives. So over the past six plus years, uh, American Red Cross has hosted many, many, many mapathons with volunteers and partners and have contributed many um, con uh, contributions to a lot of map data. Um, we're gonna come back to mapathons a little bit later. Other things we have done along the way and learned from um, <clears throat> in response to Typhoon Haiyan in the Philippines, uh, we built out the open map kit, um, which was, <clears throat> excuse me, um, a companion map to ODK, which at the time didn't allow us to do what we wanted to do on the ground, um, and so we built this this companion app, um, and then we also built uh, Possum, which is quite possibly one of my favorite acronyms for Possum. It's fun to say. Uh, Possum is Portable Open Street Map. So this was during the response to Ebola in West Africa, um, and it was a hardware software integration uh, for taking mapping and um, data collection tools that are normally cloud-based, um, and allowing us to take them into difficult or disconnected environments on a portable mini server. Um, Possum um, ultimately proved a little difficult to, to manage, but we'll, we'll circle back on that one. So these are just a few examples of how we gained experience in testing and building tools to help with OSM mapping in the field. And, <coughs> excuse me, contributed um, overall kind of to the, the mapping tool ecosystem. Um, through this process, we also, and, and you know, I think as importantly, 
uh, worked in collaboration to build national society uh, capacity around geo data, how to use these tools. Um, they were contributing directly to the development of them, um, and really not just during disasters, but using these tools uh, beyond any specific disaster. So what else have we learned, and what are we looking at now? So let's go back to Mapathons for a minute. Um, Mapathons are, in the scheme of things, very easy to hold as we try to look for ways to engage volunteers and partners. Um, little pizza, some computers, um, they're a lot of fun. However, uh, upon reflection, as we, as we looked back at the six plus years and we looked at the data, we realized it can be a challenge to ensure that during Mapathons that we're not just mapping, but that we're making better mappers, that we are retaining mappers, um, and most critically from a humanitarian data use perspective, we are matching the pace of validation to the pace of new mapper edits. Um, so we want to, again, write data in the right format to the right person at the right time. And it all hinges on it being the right data. And that's accurate and that's validated um, and it's up to date. And so that's a critically component, critical component of how we engage our communities in mapping um, in OSM. And, and so we, we've done a lot of thinking about um, mapathons in particular. Um, and so <clears throat> how we engage people and get them excited about engaging with the map and contributing to the map needs to be balanced with that bigger picture need for accurate accurate data. And so we've come up with a, a few ways of, of kind of cracking that, but we're still very much a, a work in progress. Um, one of the other works in progress, and, and I'm going to mix multiple metaphors here, this is kind of our white whale or tough nut to crack or chicken and egg, depending. Um, but linking data to decision making is a critical element of disaster, all parts of the disaster management cycle. Um, and interesting and helpful use of geodata requires good geodata. Um, you can make some really bad decisions on bad data, obviously. Um, two examples on the screen here of, of data with using, uh, using data for decision making. Um, the red dot image is uh, a mapping effort in Uganda where the community was mapping um, the materials being used on roofs, so thatch versus metal. Um, and this was a, an effort to um, manage risk reduction for fire hazard in, these com in this community. Um, that's one example. Another one is the uh, in a safe. Uh, and so this is an open source plugin for QGIS, which intersects current OSM data with past disaster or model impact data for planning scenarios. Um, you know, there's been mixed success with, with these particular examples. Um, in some cases, we, I can't remember which national society uh, mentioned it, but there was a, a comment made that there was more data than action in the data plan for action that was shared back to them. So it's, again, it's still a work in progress and, and everyone is actively engaged in it. Um, as we think about disaster response and recovery and preparedness, you know, you're looking at an urgent pace of response. You're looking at rapidly evolving situations. You're looking at a lot of crises happening at the same time in different places, limited resources. And so how we look to better engage our communities and our volunteers um, in new ways to not just collect the data, but also to analyze and visualize the data. These are things that long term, well, they're happening now in, in different ways. But as we look at different new methods for humanitarian response, things like early warning, early action, some of you may be familiar with forecast-based action uh, models. You know, these are all things that are potentially very powerful to assist in disaster um, uh, phases. However, it requires, it doesn't just need, <laughs> it requires more detailed, more up-to-date, more accurate data. Um, so as we move from basic maps for situational awareness uh, and base layers to geospatial analysis, um, we need to find better ways to assess the quality and completeness of, of the data. Um, and also build more advanced mapping skills in the communities that we engage with, build familiarity among our program managers across national societies about uh, the possibilities as, as well as the limitations of incorporating OSM into their planning and decision making. Uh, we continue to be super committed to open, the open source community. Uh, open Map Kit, oh, sorry, Open Map Kit ultimately um, was hard to maintain. Uh, Possum, which was built from scratch, uh, was never really easy to use. Oh, five minutes. Okay, I'm going to speed up. Too much caffeine. Um, so, but again, for the getting the right info in the right format to the right person at the right time, um, 
we're working currently with ODK to kind of bring over some of the functionality that we built out in Open Map Kit into ODK. And specifically, it's about tying uh, survey collection in the field to an, an existing entity. So it's much more useful for our purposes to be able to update um, what's already been collected about something, whether that's a, 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 a residential um, house or a farm or a patient um, or a neighborhood, then starting from scratch. Uh, we are also working uh, with Kobo to make those tools available uh, more widespread across our national societies. Uh, drone map, just want to uh, push that or flag that one. It's near and dear to Dan's heart. Uh, we've been working with national societies in Indonesia, the Philippines, and Haitian Red Cross um, to process drone imagery uh, into areas being mapped into OSM. Mapswipe <clears throat> is where we have transitioned away from mapathons. A um, few key points about MapSwipe. Um, MapSwipe allows us to engage still volunteers and partners who are new mappers or sometime mappers, but in, a, in an environment where they are not making direct edits to the map. Um, and we're also using this to uh, push projects that were previously mapped during our mapathons into this environment and then have the users um, do some light touch validation of that. And so early results are actually quite interesting. Um, I can happy to talk about map swipe offline if anyone's interested with that, but I'm going to keep moving. Uh, we're also super interested in exploring better ways to integrate street level imagery into our collection and analysis of, of geodata. Um, you know, can we leverage something like pick for review or map roulette um, to generate data that we need in disaster response? And harking back to a conversation from yesterday in the movement session, you know, how do we engage people in adding more details to OSM, both as collectors as well as consumers? And how do we how do we do that in a way that as we look about as we look at our volunteers, not just the American Red Cross, but also across all of our national societies? We're talking about a, a large community that is already invested and engaged and knowledgeable about their their spaces and their places, and so really looking to to leverage and, and increase their ability to to contribute and to consume from the map is is something that we're very much thinking through and thinking about um, because more than anything. <clears throat> You know, tools are tools, and tech is tech. And for us, it's really about the people. It's about humanity. It's about the humans. And you know, tools need people to care about them. And everyone here cares about this tool. Um, and it's important to nurture the, to nurture them and maintain and grow the community. So we want to very much improve and continue to increase our engagement in in that process. Um, so I will end with these are some of the things that we've done, some of the things we've learned, some of the things we're still learning. Um, on our Red Cross journey to be better stewards and users of OSM. So thank you for listening.